so she is with us as much as she is able. Afterwards, we will have questions, so hang on to your questions. Now it's time to introduce Dr. Lisa Natividad from Guam, Guam. She is a Chamorro person whose island is almost entirely taken over by the US military, so warnings for us, it's happening here as well. And uh, Lisa also manages a private behavioral health practice, as well as being a professor of social work at the University of Guam. She's been affiliated with the International Peace Bureau and the International Network of Women Against Militarism. All really important work. So thank you, Lisa, for gracing us with your presence. Welcome. Joan for that introduction and hope day everyone. Um, I wanted to begin by um, presenting an offering from our indigenous traditions to the original landowners of this land, the Aboriginal people. And so I share Manote ye gisan hilo iman unku na totlan siha, the intina iman mata, iman mofana na tata, iman motu giman finet in a sacman siha, intina imanyan mami, the intina iman unku na totlan siha. So this is the offering to the bones, the ancestral bones of the first people to arrive here. Um, it's so ironic that uh, the topic of our discussion is focused on the links with Australia militarily, particularly through AUKUS. But in actuality, our people's migration into the Pacific were the first peoples into the Pacific. And we came largely from South China into Taiwan and merged with Aboriginal peoples as we moved up into the Pacific to populate the entire Pacific region. So our links are very deep and wide and way longer than any of us in this room have been around. And so as Joan shared, I come from an island that is a US territory. Um, I often refer to our island of Wuhan as America's best kept secret. Um, its military agenda is largely motivated as the American population is told uh, with the intent of spreading democracy. Yet in its own territory, of Wuhan, democracy does not exist. We do not have the right to vote for a US president. We may have an elected delegate to the US Congress, but that person doesn't have any what's called a true vote. Mm -hmm. uh, they only vote in committee, but if they there's a tiebreaker, then their vote is voided. And so it, that's those are just two examples of the illusion of inclusion uh, mm -hmm. of our people in the political process when in fact there really isn't. It truly is classic old school colonization. Mm -hmm. um, we are one of 16 left in the world, remnants of the 1960s movement of decolonization. Mm -hmm. um, and the main reason that we remain of this status is not because we haven't tried hard enough. It's not because we haven't sent generations of people to the United Nations. It's not because we haven't held plebiscites. It's because we are the largest landmass that the US owns mm -hmm. and will not let it go because of our ge geopolitical strat uh, strategic location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so AUKUS oh, is just another thing added to the litany of ways in which US militarism has impacted our lives. I was here in 2007, hosted by Ms. Joan here. Um, and at the time, the hot potato was the relocation of the transfer of 8,000 Marines from Okinawa, Japan to our island. Um, and since then, you know, we've had so many other further developments in terms of uh, expansion of the military footprint on our island. And to contextualize our island, we are a tiny little island, literally a dot on the map that is probably the size comparable to Adelaide proper. So we're a very small place and the US Department of Defense currently occupies one third of the island. And so with the expansion, it continues. Um, I was just sharing with Joan earlier that the latest expansion that they're anticipating is the creation of an iron dome on our island, similar to that in Israel, with 20 missile defense uh, sites on our little island. So suffocated is not even the right word to describe what it feels like in occupied territory. So we totally understand that. And you know, genocide comes in many different shapes and forms and different strategies. And with ours, it's a slow, insidious uh, death of our people, really. Um, and so usually I talk about all the problems of militarism from the environment and land disposition, and I can go on and on and on about that. But I was inspired today 
uh, with our visit to the Navy establishment here where the submarines are to be uh, birthed, uh, meaning birthings where the birthings exist and where there was a dry dock um, because there was great discussion around what we're often told as communities about why the military expansion was good for us. Mm -hmm. And that is largely for the economic agenda. And so even though we're a tiny little island and AUKUS, does, there's no G in AUKUS <laughs> to represent who, us, um, but already there's a very clear direct connection. And I'll just share with you uh, some words from a news story about the impact on Guahan um, with, with uh, AUKUS. And so Gamma is the name of the project that is being developed on our island. And so it says, and I'll quote, Gamma also has the potential to serve as a hub in the Indo-Pacific for educating and training members of the Australian industrial base and perhaps personnel that support the Royal Australian Navy. While the Gamma initiative is currently focused on meeting the Navy's needs, the Astro president said the goals is to also expand to other markets using new capabilities to provide replacement parts for other industries, including aviation and automotive maintenance and repair. And so this just really gleans what we already know in terms of militarization, that it is an industrial complex that's largely motivated by profits um, and that we as community members really are casualties of that process. And so I wanted to share a couple of uh, case examples in terms of looking at the economic impacts of militarization. And so I know the IPAN conference, I believe it was the last one that was a couple of years ago in Darwin, the more recent one, uh, one of your guest speakers or your presenters was from Okinawa, uh, Shinako-san. And um, Okinawa is a very good example of the fallacy of the military money that's supposed to fall from heaven and grace yeah. us and make life better. <laughs> uh, because Okinawa, as it is in this, it's about 0.6% of the land, or I'm sorry, 6% of the land mass of the country of Japan, if it's included in that definition. Um, and yet they host 75% of the US military uh, personnel in the country of Japan, which is in the multiple thousands. It's a huge base. There are multiple bases all over Okinawa. And so you would think then that with all of that military presence that their economy would be the most thriving, but the reverse is the case. Okinawa is actually the poorest prefecture in the country of Japan, which hosts these military bases that are from the US. And so it, it starts to question, right? To really like ask yourself the question, okay, if this is good for our economy, then where's the evidence that shows that? A second example um, that was examined was by Dr. Catherine uh, Lutz from Brown University in the US. And she did a, she had wrote a whole book called Homefront. And she looks at the community of Fayetteville, North Carolina, which hosts uh, our, the Army Naval Bragg, a, a whole bunch of different bases, very heavily militarized uh, community. And the same thing she found in her research. You know, the military, when they, in communities, at least in the US, as in the case of Guahan, they're very self-contained. They have their own medical systems. They have their own shopping systems. And so she said, and a huge proportion of a young military population, which is often the case because in the US military, they generally serve for 20 years and are eligible for retirement. So we're talking about a very young population of military personnel. And so what she found in the case of Fayetteville, North Carolina, was that they were paid so poorly that they actually, and they didn't contribute to the tax base, really critical uh, factor. Yeah. They don't contribute to the tax base. And what they did do, what the way they did impact the, the economy was that they were eligible for different entitlement programs in that socioeconomic level. So in other words, rather than contributing to the economic activity of the city, they actually extrapolated without contributing by tax, right? So second case example. And then a third one I wanted to share, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Cora uh, Fabros from the Philippines often talks about the case of the closure of the bases in the Philippines. She was actually on the committee along with Walden Bello um, that made the decision to not renew the, the lease with the United States for the military bases. I believe that was in the 90s. And so what the Philippines did was they converted the Subic area, which is where they were having massive military uh, uh, naval bases, they converted it into an economic center, uh, granted for industrialization, whatever other kinds of economic projects, but they were able to successfully convert that. Mm -hmm. And when the, when the United States Department of Defense pulled out of the Philippines, they literally 
left their mess behind. Mm -hmm. Literally left their mess behind. Abandoned vehicles, mm -hmm. the whole nine yards. Um, and their justification for that was that it wasn't written into their status of forces agreement. Oh, no. Cleanup was not written. So that's something to be very mindful of when we're talking about environmental contamination that we know is part and parcel to military preparation for war and military activities. And so I wanted to share a little bit about our own experience in Guahan with um, this transfer of Marines from Okinawa to Guam. And so the, in the US context, and because we're a territory, they're bound by these laws, they have to follow what is called the NEPA process, which stands for the National Environmental Protection Act, right? So that we go through this whole process of assessing the proposed impacts of this uh, project. And so in this case, it was the transfer of these Marines and the construction of a base. And so we go through a process of scoping meetings with the community, and then they actually release and have all these researchers to examine every dimension of how it's supposed to impact our lives. We give draft, we go through a draft environmental impact uh, process. And so as a community, we submitted over 10,000 comments from an island of 165,000 people. We submitted 10,000 comments of concerns uh, of the impacts of this move. Nothing was changed in terms of their plan, just to, to uh, put that at the front. But then, then it goes through a final environmental impact statement and they, they release this final um, record of decision. And in their record of decision and in their report that was released, it specifically said that there will be no significant economic impacts by this project. So even there in writing, right, even though that's counter to the rhetoric that we're fed and that we're told, Clearly, the evidence reports uh, show that. And so I wanted to mention, you know, um, in the in the van when we're doing, I'm sorry, in the bus when we're doing our touring earlier today, um, whenever you've got military expansion, especially if they bring their dependents, you need to put them somewhere. So in our case, housing gets very significantly impacted. The cost of housing becomes very significantly increased because landlords will hold out to get the bigger money. And so what happens to the community members, mm -hmm. right? In terms of housing, housing becomes inaccessible. Oftentimes it results in homelessness. And we're seeing this at home in an island where when I was raised as a young child, we never saw a single homeless person mm -hmm. on the street or anywhere else. And because family networks were very strong, we held them close to us and, and we got through it together. But now what you're finding, it's an impossible situation. And our homeless count uh, in the past year, we do an annual homeless count, a point in time count, and it was over 3,000 people, you know, in a community of 170. So you see the very direct impact in terms of housing costs, very much related to the military uh, presence. You have the over recruitment of our youth, economic conscripts. When you have a poor community, the military is a step up. I always say, I, I teach at the university, and our ROTC students come to campus and they all have big trucks. I said, you join the military, you get a big truck. You know, it's a very simple kind of formula that for poor communities really, and, and then discounted shopping in a military a commissary is very enticing mm -hmm. in poor communities, especially in families where people suffer. Um, and then the lastly, I just wanted to mention that as part of our Guam draft environmental impact statement, um, the economists do their calculations looking at the economy. And so they, one such um, calculation is called a macroeconomic multiplier, which basically, from my layman social work perspective uh, and understanding is it, it traces sort of the dollar in the community and how far it circulates to, to impact in a positive way the community. And what was discovered in the case of Guahan was that what would happen is that there would be a little bit of, there would be a boom, right? With this base construction. And it really was just a construction period for five years. Well, that boom comes down pretty quickly in five years and for us, the total income generated from that construction boom was about $230 million. What we started to realize is you can save $230 million, but what we are concerned about as community members is what is the cumulative impact to our lives, right? When you've got um, this construction boom that, by the way, needs to be fueled by an imported labor force of 20,000 people, this labor force does not leave when construction is done. They generally settle, right? And where are their needs? How, when they need to go to the doctor, what hospital do they go to? They have no privileges on the base. So for us, the subsidizing of this military construction and plan 
on the on the backs of our own local community was way bigger than any two hundred and thirty thousand uh, million dollars. Mm. And so one former governor who actually supported the build up had quoted saying that it would cost us at least a billion dollars in terms of upgrading our infrastructure because we didn't have the infrastructure for the population increase. Right? Their plan increased our increases our population by about 30%. And who's paying for that? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's all just to say that we really need to think critically about what we're fed in terms of the economic uh, prosperity that comes with military bases. And to dispel this idea that um, if the military bases pull out, then we'll get we'll go hungry. We'll have no jobs. The economy will dry up. Mm -hmm. Philippines had the courage to be able to say, no, we're not going to continue that in a country that didn't have the most resources, but they figured it out. They found a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all can have the courage to do the same. And so I'm here in solidarity um, with the people of Australia, with a lot of friendly faces across this room who I've seen multiple times, multiple years, um, but really just to, to reinforce that, you know, people power is the most prominent, most important thing to shift our communities. And we can't ever forget the power that we have. So just